Hi, my name is Melanie Tucker, Senior Acquisitions Editor for Neurology here at Elsevier. I am delighted to be interviewing Dr. David Preston of Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio today to discuss the newly published fourth edition of his book, Electromyography and Neuromuscular Disorders. Dr. Preston, can you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, it's nice to be here with you. Uh, my name is uh, David C. Preston. Uh, I'm a neurologist at uh, University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. I'm a professor of neurology at Case Western Reserve uh, University here in Cleveland, Ohio. And in our Department of Neurology at our Neurological Institute, I serve as the program director of the residency and the vice chairman of the department. Great, thank you. So I'd like to begin with asking you, what are the hot topics in neurology right now? Well, neurology is an ever-changing field, and there are several hot topics in neurology, but in my opinion, probably the two that really rise to the top are really genetics and imaging. First, as uh, far as genetics, there are many neurologic disorders in all parts of the nervous system, be it the brain, the spinal cord, the cerebellum, the peripheral nerves, and the muscle that, that are genetic in nature. And we've known about the genetics for many, many years, but now the genetics are really getting figured out to exactly what the gene is, what the protein is, and maybe how to combat it by either uh, fixing the gene, stopping the gene product. And now there is now more widespread testing of genetic disorders and very excitingly treatment for genetic disorders. And many of these are actually in neuromuscular, that's peripheral nerve and muscle. The other aspect which is very hot in that is of imaging. Obviously, imaging has revolutionized neurology over the past several decades. It started with the introduction of the CT scanner back in the 1970s that, that finally allowed us to look inside the nervous system and then supplemented by MRI scan in the 1980s, which has now become standard for so many things in the nervous system. However, MRI scan is predominantly used for the central nervous system, that's brain and spinal cord. There are some MRI techniques to look at muscle. There are some more sophisticated techniques to look at peripheral nerve, but these are only used at actually certain centers. However, an additional imaging modality is that of ultrasound, which is now being used, especially in the peripheral nervous system, to look at uh, peripheral nerves and muscles, which now have dramatically increased our ability to help diagnose and treat patients with various nerve and muscle disorders. Great, thank you. So can you tell us about the newest edition of electromyography and neuromuscular disorders? Uh, certainly, so this is the fourth edition of the book. The book was meant to be a basic primer on neuromuscular disorders and uh, performing EMG and nerve conduction studies. And of course, a lot of the basics have not changed. However, this fourth edition did allow us to uh, systematically review the literature over the past five, six, seven years and, that, and add new information that's available as far as various nerve and muscle disorders. Uh, some are brand new conditions, some have now been figured out. In addition, we've always been big believers that pictures are worth a thousand words. Uh, the uh, other uh, textbooks always had lots of figures and diagrams. We've actually increased the number of figures and diagrams uh, in this book to even make it more readable. However, in the last edition, one of the major uh, improvements of the third edition is that we included cross-sectional anatomy. And that was cross-sectional anatomy for doing mostly a needle EMG. This was so important to be able to think in three dimensions. So you knew how to place the needle in the muscle correctly, but also more importantly, what was nearby, what you needed to avoid other nerves and muscles and uh, blood vessels. Well, that really foreshadowed the fourth edition in, in that, that we have now included uh, neuromuscular ultrasound as a substantial part of the book. Um, so the neuromuscular ultrasound has dramatically uh, improved over uh, the last decade and now is getting to be used routinely in the evaluation of patients with peripheral nerve and muscle. We have three new chapters in the book on uh, ultrasound. One is an overview of ultrasound. The second one is on uh, the evaluation of mononeuropathies, that's individual nerves, say like median nerve at the wrist, carpal tunnel, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, uh, perineal neuropathy at the, uh, at the knee. And then a third chapter on the usefulness of ultrasound uh, in regards to the evaluation of motor neuron disease, uh, peripheral neuropathies, and myopathy. 
Then, of course, in, similar to the, the previous editions of the book, there are many clinical chapters that march through uh, various different diagnoses. Almost all of these chapters now include separate sections on the usefulness of ultrasound in their diagnosis. For instance, now you can turn to the chapter on radial nerve problems. Uh, once again, learn about the nerve and muscle uh, clinical uh, uh, condition. Then of the electrodiagnosis, that's the nerve conductions and EMG. But now there's an additional section about how ultrasound may help you even further characterize and treat your patient. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit more about neuromuscular ultrasound and how it's revolutionizing the field? Neuromuscular ultrasound is really an incredibly exciting thing. Uh, I am all in on this. I have totally changed my opinion on this over the last uh, 10 years. I will tell you that neuromuscular ultrasound dates back to the 1980s when Dubowitz and colleagues used it to look at young boys who had Duchenne muscular dystrophy and noted a profound change in the muscle in muscular dystrophy as opposed to normal muscle. It was used by various neuromuscular specialists uh, just, just intermittently over the years, especially to uh, choose a muscle biopsy site and characterize muscle, but it really never gained widespread acceptance. Indeed, when we wrote the third edition of the book, you know, over 10 years ago, I had reviewed all the neuromuscular uh, uh, ultrasound literature, and honestly, in my humble opinion, I thought it wasn't quite ready for prime time. I wasn't quite sure if it would really help very much. Well, let me tell you, my opinion has changed 180 degrees. Over the last 10 or so years, there's just been a revolution in ultrasound. As all of us probably know, ultrasound is now used in many other specialties. It's now basically very common for emergency room doctors to use ultrasound, for anesthesiologists to use it for, reno, for, for regional uh, anesthesia, for orthopedists to use it for musculoskeletal ultrasound, especially with uh, tendons and the rotator cuff. Well, now it's being applied to um, peripheral nerve and muscle. And this has happened for several reasons. First, the technology, like other technology, has just continued to improve. So now what you can do is just much, much easier and much, much better. Then the cost of the technology has come down. So now most ultrasound machines that we use for neuromuscular ultrasound, they're similar in cost to say an EMG machine. And indeed there's some manufacturers that are working on incorporating ultrasound and EMG into uh, one device. Then the physical size of the ultrasound machine has gone down. So many of these machines are quite small, they're quite portable, they're just a little bit bigger than like a laptop computer. So you can easily put them on a cart, they run on a battery, they're wireless, and you can go from room to room. However, what's even more important is that there's been an explosion of research on neuromuscular ultrasound. There are now literally hundreds, if not thousands, of peer-reviewed articles per year attesting to the, uh, the value of neuromuscular ultrasound. There are now practice parameters written by major societies. There are major institutions that now give courses on neuromuscular ultrasound, and it's now being incorporated into uh, training programs, almost all fellowships, and now starting into the residencies. Now, of course, with ultrasound, it also has the advantage that it is painless and it has no safety problems. So diagnostic ultrasound, as we well know, when is used, say, on pregnant women to look at the baby, there's no downside to the baby. So when we use ultrasound on the patient, there's no downside to the patient for us looking at their nerves and muscles. The amazing thing about ultrasound is that it is not a replacement for electrodiagnosis, but it's a complement to electrodiagnosis. So electrodiagnosis really allows us to diagnose, is there a problem with the nerve or all the nerves in the muscle? It allows us to characterize it physiologically. It tells us something about the acuity, but it doesn't really tell us about what might actually be causing the problem. Ultrasound is different. It doesn't assess the physiology of the nerve and muscle, but it gives us a picture of the nerve and muscle and other structural abnormalities. So for instance, a patient could come to us and says, Doc, you know, my thumb, my index, and my middle finger, they're falling asleep and going numb, and my hand is really hurting. And every night I'm waking up and I'm shaking it out, and it's really bothering me. And you very quickly come to the clinical diagnosis that this person probably has carpal tunnel syndrome, and you're correct. 
you can then bring them to the EMG laboratory and very nicely confirm that they have slowing of their median nerve across the carpal tunnel, and you can assess its severity and make sure it's nothing, nothing else. So at that point, you're very sure that you have the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome clinically, and that it's caused by a median nerve problem uh, at the wrist. However, at that point, with all due respect, do you know what's causing it? Is it due to just wear and tear because you're typing too much or you have your hand in an awkward uh, position? Or do you have tenosynovitis? Or do you have a ganglion cyst that's compressing the median nerve? Or do you have amyloid deposition? Or do you have a schwannoma? Or do you have a persistent median artery, which is thrombosed? And the list goes on and on. So it really adds important diagnostic information that dramatically influences the care of the patient. I will tell you that all of our neuromuscular attendings here at Case Western Reserve, regardless if they actually do ultrasound or not, basically say the same thing. They say, what did we do before we had neuromuscular ultrasound? Because it has totally revolutionized how we approach and how we treat patients. It may be somewhat embarrassing to say, but as a professor of neurology, I would say that my knowledge of peripheral anatomy has probably doubled since learning neuromuscular ultrasound. So my anatomy is much better, which also then makes me a much better electromyographer. And then secondly, as a professor of neurology, I am now routinely diagnosing uh, problems with ultrasound uh, on conditions that I didn't even know existed two or three years ago. So it really has revolutionized uh, the care of our patients. Um, now, that, that is, is it the key to the case in every patient? No, it is it's absolutely not. However, it adds important complementary information for a lot of patients. And in some patients, this is actually the key. It works out that the doctor who does electrodiagnosis, which is what this book of, is about, is the doctor who should probably be doing the ultrasound as well, because we are the ones who understand that these what these peripheral nerve disorders are, what these muscle disorders are. We understand the clinical, we understand the electrodiagnosis. So with that information, we can maximally use ultrasound to our advantage. So it really has been a gigantic uh, improvement in our treatment of patients. And in my opinion, it is a complete no brainer. The use of ultrasound is just gonna continue, continue to grow and improve uh, as time goes by and it's gonna be a common part of every single electrodiagnostic lab uh, in the future, in my opinion. Wow, well, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us more about the game-changing neuromuscular ultrasound and the, about the new fourth edition of your book, Electromyography and Neuromuscular Disorders. We'll be offering a couple of chapters free of charge for a limited time, so be sure to check them out. Thank you so much, Dr. Preston, for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you.